G'day Legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic Friday and going to have a great weekend. Now, today we're going to talk about some trains mysteriously derailing, fighter jets, a small accounting error, and some news. But, of course, as always, let's have a look at the maps. And as we just zoom out here, we see we have Ukraine in the center and the capital of Kiev. The red areas, areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 14. And, of course, the green areas which have been liberated since the 22 invasion. We have Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia around here. Now, what we're going to do is have a look in on Bakhmut. Now, the map does show today what I spoke about yesterday is I had information from a source that Russia did push back across a waterway in the south. And let's have a look at what I was speaking about yesterday and what I got told. So we looked at this map yesterday and we're talking about this waterway here that Russia was up to and the Ukraine managed to push them back off. And my source said no, today there was a counter-attack and Russia did push the Ukrainians back across that. So today on the map, it does show that. Let's have a look in the center of Bakhmut and see what we have seen change. So from yesterday till today. Nothing really significant in the center, at least on the deep state map, but we will talk about this among some other maps as well. The Kiev Independent has written, as of May 18th, Russia controls over 95% of Bakhmut, with the latest open source maps showing Ukrainian forces holding onto a handful of streets and apartment buildings on the western outskirts of the city. And Russian sources are saying it's 98% and 2%. But let's have a look at a couple of things. So we have haven't seen any dramatic change here, but let's have a look on the ISW map and what are we seeing? Not that much dramatically different as far as the assessed control to the claimed control. Let's have a look at the ISW map from yesterday and then we'll have a look at today's. Now, what is showing too much different? Not really that much, but we do see more claimed control up to this road through Komove, through here as Bakhmut slowly becomes under more control of the Wagner forces working within this region. Now, we have footage that is geolocated to here. So we see where this road comes around and one straight through. And we're going to talk about this in a second because this whole area is claimed to be under control by now the Russian Wagner forces. But we have this video here of a Ukrainian soldier which is geolocated to that position with an RPG-7. And you can hear the amount of fighting around here. Burnt out vehicles. Every building has been absolutely riddled with shelling. And we can then see this RPG-7 then fire aiming into this building here. Making sure it's seated. And then he's then fired from there. With another guy with a recoilless rifle there as well, firing into those buildings. So that again is geolocated to here. So we know that they're fighting right on the outskirts of here and shooting down into these buildings across from here. Now, we talk about these updates. So let's have a look at the most recent Wagner Sources map that has come out and show what is different. Now, we're just going to have the deep state open with this one as well, as I believe these are the most reliable. Now, what they're claiming is this whole region here has come under control. Now, they're calling this the domino area. So we see this turn around through here, this road through here. They're claiming that the whole way down here along and even pushing further out down through here, basically where this whole grey zone is, is under Wagner control. And this map was released only last night by the Wagner sources. So we have yesterday's one that came out as well that we reported on. So the Wagner map on the left from yesterday and today on the right. Now this is showing the uh, gains from the Ukrainian forces on the north and southern flanks here, which are the same on both maps except for this area down here, which is lost by the Russian armed forces. Another area right down amongst here, which is near to where we talked about just before. So it is showing more area that Ukraine is controlling. But Interestingly, it is showing very different in the center here. As we look on this road through Komove, they have moved to the south of this and have claimed more control in the center region here. Although the Western sources maps being the deep state, the ISW are not showing that. So let's have a look on then the Rybar Russian sources and see what it is showing here. And it is showing very similar as well. This road we talked about that loops around with the run running through it, that they have crossed to the south of that. Let's look at Rybar from yesterday. And it is not showing that. You're showing the orange and red, which is like gray area equivalent that is through there, but not that they control area across that. So it is showing on the Rybar 
very similar to what the deep state is showing uh, sorry what the wagner is showing here they have crossed now maybe not to the same degree but it is showing that cross and as well heavy fighting in around this mig 17 stat MiG-17 statue in here. Heavy fighting ranks there, but more pushing up across this road through Komove and then down through, which is the same in and around this area. So what map to believe? I don't know. This is why I show you multiple of them. So we have War Mapper as well, and War Mapper is very conservative towards any gains. What does it show? It shows from the 17th to now that Russia did lose more terrain here and in the center has shown more advancement as well, but nowhere near the advancement that the Russian sources are showing. The Russian sources are saying it's down to basically where this bridge is, down and across to where this road then comes to the left if you're traveling to the south. So it is showing a very different picture amongst these maps. Russian bloggers are saying that they managed to get more territory in around Madiinka. Now, the deep state does not show that. But if we look then on the ISW, which is who actually initially reported this, we can see the amount of claim control and assessed control in and around here, which is different somewhat to the deep state map. So we look, we have this first and second bridge here that they are claiming that the Russian have claim control right up to this second bridge here, which is not being shown at all on this map. These are showing very different. The claim control is down to this border here and beyond the first bridge where they're just showing a completely different picture in and around here. And who to believe? I don't know. I believe there is still heavy fighting going on within the center and who is controlling on the flanks in these regions. I don't know. But we've talked about how Marinka can be so easily supported as there's so many main roads leading in that that is where Russia have had many problems, but they need to get Marienka because it leads straight down into here, which is Vugladar, that they can mutually support each other. But we do have some footage of Marienka over the last couple of days. So we're going to look, and if you look at Marienka, firstly, one of the things you notice on the map is this intersection in here with the road looping around. And this is from only the last couple of days, the amount of destruction we see on this road and the buildings around it. Here. So this is facing down that road. And we also have drone footage in and around Marienka as well of just the sheer amount of destruction. And look how many holes there are from relentless months and months of artillery, artillery holes all through the building and all these buildings just flattened to absolutely nothing on the ground. And there is more footage of just buildings that are just scarred, not even scarred, just completely collapsed, and the amount of pockmarking of the ground in and around there. But no substantial changes on the map, and the place we do see the most uh, action happening is in and around Bakhmut. Now, many are pointing that Rain Russia take this, then they will be able to be surrounded by the Ukrainian forces, which Ukraine hasn't had that much of a significant gain on these flanks yet to encircle these forces in here. And people will even say that even if Ukraine does push in, you open yourself up then to encirclement as well. So as you know, anytime you push forward in somewhere, you open yourself to encirclement. So what will happen over the coming days, weeks, I don't really know. We know Ukraine is having counteroffensives on these flanks, and we know that they are shaping for offensives in this region, but we know this is being heavily guarded, and Ukraine sources saying that uh, Russian forces are deploying more forces into the Bakhmut region. We saw Prigozhin playing the game to get more people in this area as well, but as far as the city, you'll see, you know, pages saying Bakhmut holds. If it's 5% from the Ukrainian sources, 2% from the Russian sources, let's take an average there of 3 4%. I wouldn't really claim that that is holding, but we don't know what that action will then take if Ukraine do do major flanking operations and could cut off or encircle there as well, or we could see Russia do vice versa. I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know what the end state actually looks like in this region. No one does. A train has derailed in occupied Crimea at this geolocated location. So it is in here you can see the train line, and this runs between Sevastopol and Smyrpol. Now it is unclear exactly what happened. The Crimean railways in their statement have said, today on May 18th, 23, a freight train derailed as a result of intervention by unauthorized persons in the operation of railway transport. The movement of commuter trains is temporarily suspended. Neither the railway or Russian media have mentioned any explosion. That said, from online speculation, it is said that a small IED was laid under the railway track, causing the derailment 
of multiple cars. Although from the photos I've seen, there isn't any clear evidence of an explosion, but this would seem like the most plausible situation for this. So let's have a look at some of this and look at some of the photographs and the video as well. So we see these railway cars here that have been derailed. We can see the uh, track where it has had some level of uh, interference they're called the derailment whether an IED or something else we see that there is a dip in the scoria earth here and see so again the military uniform as this has been taped off and being investigated by the FSB and we can have some footage here as well of the front engine of the train and that a few cars in maybe five or six cars back there was multiple cars get then derailed and you can see in these photographs where the grain has tipped out of these freight cars onto the ground and this was from an interview on the site five carriages have been overturned three more have just been derailed but remain standing on the rail line and there are no casualties it's only carriages that got damaged thank god there was no loss of human life now we have seen a number of suspected sabotage acts throughout crimea and several against russian railways since the beginning of this conflict you know we know ukrainian partisans have had a major role to play in this conflict especially in occupied Kherson and crimea with a number of major explosions in crimea as ukrainian counteroffensives move from the staging shaping and probing operations we see into the more full-scale invasion we will see a large increase in these partisan actions but well behind the lines you know from clear attacks like this to unseen targeting information and reconnaissance we know that this has been highly active by foreign agents in both ukraine and russia with foreign entities enabling much of this with civilians recruited as foreign agents to give information maybe just as simple of hey if you see this system text the address of it to this number even down to putting up posters in territory that may become occupied on how to surrender if you're a troop civilian partisans are active through all large conflicts but that said civilians do lose their protected status when acting actively participating in the conflict and as they're seen as combatants and can be tried on espionage and treason the punishment for treason can be the most serious and we've seen examples like this throughout the war so this was right at the very beginning and this is getting updated actually by abc australia being a state broadcaster nine days after russia invaded ukraine a prominent banker was thrown from a van in central kiev with a gunshot wound to the head dennis Kariev, a ukrainian had just returned from belarus where he'd been assisting with peace talks between russia and ukraine Ukraine. But as he lay dead in the street, rumors quickly spread that Ukrainian intelligence agents had found out he was a spy for Russian President Vladimir Putin. During the arrest, the security service of Ukraine shot dead Denis Kariev. This is from Ukrainian MP Oleksiy, and I won't try to pronounce that on his Telegram channel at the time. He was suspected of high treason, being the most serious form of treason. His execution appeared to be the proof that if Ukraine was going to defeat its aggressive neighbor, it would also have to confront the enemy within. The Ukrainian state was well aware that Russia had spent years trying to infiltrate its government, intelligence services, and military, which they had had success on, as we've seen a number of foreign players getting arrested in Ukraine, and Zelensky also increasing the punishment for treason and high treason. Now that Russia had troops on the ground, some Ukrainian officials looked at their colleagues and wondered whose side they were really on. But nearly a year after Kerev's slaying, his death is still a subject of fierce debate inside Ukraine. The man killed for being a Kremlin double agent may in fact have been a Ukrainian spy all along. Ukraine's spy chief Kerev should be remembered as a hero's a hero whose intelligence helped to keep Kiev from falling into Russian hands. But who was? But who killed Kiev and why they did it is still a mystery yet to be unravelled. Was it a catastrophic error made in the fog of war, or did saboteurs within Ukraine's intelligence community want Kiev? Dead continues to describe the events. When Kriev and his bodyguards drove to the SBU headquarters in central Kriev, they were suddenly surrounded by a fleet of vans. The SBU sort of rose from the ashes of what was the KGB in the Soviet Union, and the SBU does have a quite reputation if you speak to anyone in Ukraine or has worked in Ukraine. They simply broke into the oncoming traffic. Operatives ran out shouting, It's the SBU. Mayor General Budanov told the Radio Svoboda. Kirev was arrested just 200 metres from his destination. He was transferred to a minibus, which he went not to the central SBU building, but several blocks away. Then what happened? His body fell out of that van. The 45-year-old father of a young son was shot dead in the back of a minivan. His body was dumped on the street. While local Ukrainian media initially reported this incident as the elimination of a Russian agent, uh, Major Budanov said that this was a fake story planted to protect the people who killed Kareev. 
The Ukrainian president's office said that it believes Kiev's death was a devastating mistake made in the chaos of war. It said poor coordination between the two intelligence services led the SBU to wrongly conclude Kiev was a traitor. Other intelligence agents being the Ukrainian GUR, which doesn't quite have the reputation of the SBU. Budinov remains sceptical that this was an accident. He believes people who killed Kiev were trying to disrupt the ceasefire talks in Belarus. Whoever did it on purpose wanted to prevent us from interfering in someone else's game. There was a certain number of people who, let's didn't say, did not really want Ukraine to win. And this is my personal opinion. So the reason I use this example is it isn't clear who actually was at work here. As, you know, foreign agents from any country, you could draw a tie to why they would want someone discussing Pete peace talks, then eliminate it. Also, the degree that agents will work in their country or foreign nations. Sometimes even intelligence services counter other state intelligence agencies. Now, working for an acronym agency might sound cool, but the risks and responsibilities that come with it are huge. It's not all James Bond shooting pistols, getting girls wearing a Rolex. It's not that. We have spoken in length about Ukraine's dire need for modern fighter aircraft to increase its chances in these counter offensives, greatly improving its combined arms capability and to support the troops on the front line. We have also spoken about the huge logistical effort that these aircrafts take and the training. And We've seen the request from the very top of the Ukrainian military wish list for a long time. If history is anything to go by, then eventually we will see these flying in Ukraine after a number of no answers from the West. People talk about F-16s and other fighter aircraft as if they're a 1999 Toyota Corolla that they just start up and drive around. Fighter aircraft are incredibly maintenance heavy, expensive, and a huge high priority target. That said, they make up for this in their ability to shape the battlefield when used correctly with ground forces and other airborne assets. But the main issue people, including myself, have posed about fighter aircraft is the time frame of training pilots from converting from Soviet platforms to Western fighter jets. That said, if the West started training pilots when this war broke out, or even six months in, they would be ready to fly now and would be on these upcoming operations. We know that there are pilots in the EU training and pilots have gone to the US to assess how long it would take to reach a competent standard for combat flying. And I've heard figures from four months to 24 months. We know that the British and the Dutch have formed an international coalition to help procure F-16 fighter jets for Ukraine. But unlike the titles you may see on articles, I haven't really seen anything set in stone about F-16s or any other fighter aircraft, especially when the Brits don't operate F-16s. Now, Germany has indicated it will not participate in this alliance, and Schulz has said there are no demands regarding us. The German Defence Minister, Boris Pistorius, has said we cannot play an active role in such an alliance, in such a coalition, because we have neither the training capacities, the competencies, or the planes. That's a Germany is not against the supply of fighter aircraft, and Germany cop a lot of shit, but they are the third largest single donor to Ukraine. CNN have reported today, now I know CNN as a source is rough, but they've reported that the Biden administration has signaled to European allies in recent weeks that the US would allow them to export F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. The report also says sophisticated fighter jets would make it easier for Ukraine to target the Russian planes. Some congressional staffers argue without having to expensive Patriot munitions that were made to intercept ballistic missiles. Some US officials are skeptical of that argument. However, note that Russia has extensive anti-aircraft systems that could easily shoot down F-16s. Ukraine has not been conducting many air missions with the fighter planes it already has for precisely that reason. These aircraft will definitely add a huge capability to the Ukrainian Air Force, but they are not immune from Russian surface to air or advanced Russian fighters. We know from Turkey having both the Russian S-400 air defense system and F-16s that these systems are deadly. That said, these aircraft are very capable against cruise missiles and conducting seed and deed missions in which F-16s have been shown to be incredibly competent. Now, what is seed and deed? Now, these are an acronym. So, seed, the suppression of enemy air defenses. Seed refers to a military strategy and set of tactics used to suppress, neutralize, and destroy enemy air defense systems. The primary objective of seed is to reduce the effectiveness of hostile surface-to-air missiles SAMs or anti aircraft artillery, AA radars, and other air defense assets. This is typically achieved by employing specialized aircraft armed with anti-radiation missiles or other weapons designed to target and destroy enemy air defense systems. Now, we have seen the U.S. give 
uh, these anti-radiation missiles to Ukraine that have gone on Ukrainian aircraft, Soviet-era aircraft. Now, D, destruction of enemy air defences. It is similar to C, but focuses on the offensive destruction of enemy air defence systems. It involves conducting concentrated and coordinated attacks to completely destroy or render inoperable the enemy air defence capability. D, missions are typically carried out in the initial stages of military campaign or prior to a large-scale operation to ensure the safety and effectiveness of friendly aircraft. And this is what we saw Russia fail to do in the initial stages of this war, therefore could not achieve air dominance and air superiority, although Russia does have the upper hand in the air war. C and D missions are incredibly dangerous and are advanced flying missions in which America has its own specified pilots and aircraft only for these missions. And this is, like I said, something that Russia failed to do, and this was had a great effect on its then further ability to conduct its offensives that sort of went to shit in the beginning of this conflict. That said, Ukraine cannot in any realm currently conduct complete seed and deed. And this again links to what I'd be aiming for if I was a Ukrainian official, is not just these weapons, but the use of these Western weapons within Russian Federation borders. Now, we cross every other red line, so why not this one too? This is why the whole close the air campaign was just wishful thinking. The idea of the West closing the airspace, it's nice, but to do that, the West would have to send fighter jets and missiles into target Russian systems inside Russian borders in direct strikes. And even if we give Ukraine these F-16 aircraft and this equipment, they can't strike and do seed and deed within Russian Federation borders. Currently, therefore cannot completely do those missions and hold that air dominance. So Yuri Inat, the spokesman of the Ukrainian Air Force, has said that Kiev would be careful using Western jets. We are not going to use the F-16s to hit targets on Russian territory. Territory of Ukraine occupied by Russia, yes, but Russian territory, no. We also need them to patrol the border and keep Russian Air Force further away. But that said, if you're flying down the border and Russia has their advanced air defense systems within their territory and you can't hit them, that could be a suicide mission. That said, it would be a fucking power play if this entire war, the West had trained like 100 Ukrainian pilots on F-35s and B-2s and just blew the whistle on the major offensive and just 100 planes flew from Poland directly to Crimea, blasting like Creedence Clearwater Revival, just in a huge air attack no one saw coming. But that said, I think we will see modern fighter aircraft into this war because there is no end in sight and there's going to be plenty of time to train guys. Will we see these aircraft in the upcoming offensive? Absolutely not. But the implementation of these aircraft would have a large impact on the survivability of these rocket attacks and a huge effect on the front line. But be under no illusion that we'll also see modern aircraft intercepted by air-to-air -air and surface-to-air weapons as well. There are two certainties in life, death and taxes. And we know internationally that if you owe the government even one cent that you haven't paid in taxes, then they'll send them an F-16 to go and get you. But if they owe you money, well, I wish you good luck getting that back. Well, today, a Pentagon accounting error overvalued Ukraine weapon aid by three billion dollars. Now, this has occurred because the military services were using the cost estimates based on new hardware rather than depreciated older equipment. So if they've used a Humvee for 15, 20 years, and they've sent it to Ukraine, they put that figure exactly on what Humvee was worth brand new day one, not after the depreciation of that over its life. And they've said, we've discovered inconsistencies in how we value the equipment that we've given. Pentagon spokesman Sabrina Sy has said in a statement, in some cases, replacement cost rather than net book value was used, therefore overestimating the value of equipment drawdown from the US stocks. Now, if you want to look at how this equipment is actually valued, go onto Perrin's channel and have a look at his fantastic, like, hour-long video breaking this down. If you ask me, this was not an accounting error. This was sneaky accounting because this error could eliminate the Biden administration from having to go to Congress to ask for more money to fund Ukrainian military aid as they now have another $3 billion to work with. And the Pentagon has said that there may even be more. So this financial year, I want this account to do my tax. We have this Time article written on here. Using a so-called Presidential Drawdown Authority, the PDA, President Joe Biden has transferred weapons and equipment from US stocks totaling $21.1 since Russia's invasion Feb 22. The true cost is now 
estimated to be roughly 18 billion, officials said, which means the administration has roughly doubled the 2.7 billion congressionally authorized funds that were remaining to support Ukraine. So giving the administration more money without having to go back through Congress. When the miscalculation was discovered, Pentagon's controller reissued guidance clarifying how to value equipment to ensure the services use the most accurate accounting method. The process is now underway, meaning there is a possibility of additional savings can be found. Now, if this wasn't just tricky accounting, fucking hell, I want someone to look over their books because this is something that you do when you sell something. If I bought this for $600 new and I've used it a heap, it's now worth $250. Like, has anyone ever used Facebook Marketplace in the Pentagon? That's how depreciation of an asset works. But this is just some clever accounting, although it has come under fire, because if this was done earlier, then another $3 billion could have been sent to Ukraine for the upcoming offensives. Now, even if they've got another $3 billion, that funding for equipment won't make it in time for the offensives. But, legends, that's it for me today. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you're leading into the weekend well. I hope you have a beer tonight to end off your week. So, have a great afternoon, have a great weekend, and I'll speak to you tomorrow. There's an interview coming up as well. If you'd like to support me, link's down below. I never know how to sign these off, but bye-bye. Thank you.